Shakespeare's famous play is updated to the hip, modern suburb of Verona, still retaining its original dialogue. This is Ryan. And this is Ashley. And this is Ruining Ruining Our Our Childhood. Childhood. A weekly podcast where we remove our childhood goggles and put on our adult bifocals to rewatch and review our favorite movies from the past. That's right. And if this is your first time joining us, hi. Welcome. Hello. Nice to meet you. Hola. Benvenido. Is that hello? I think so. At the end of It's a Small World where they have like hello uh-huh in like 900 different languages oh, i see yeah, that you're right but maybe it's goodbye <gasps> maybe i don't know if you just said goodbye to our audience of 10 then then i retract that and i go back to saying bonjour <laughs> uh if you didn't notice from the summary that i just read we are doing romeo and juliet yes. or as i like to say romeo plus juliet because this is the baz lerman edition yeah not the uh, reimagining i remember watching one of the adaptation one of those words we watched one of the other versions like in school obviously they weren't gonna be like oh probably the historically accurate uh the frank zeffirelli one that sounds correct oh because we had to totally do that and we had to like uh study the camera angles and oh yeah no we did it like because i think we i want to say we read the play and then they're like we're we're gonna watch it i would hope so i think every child has to read that play at some point I don't know why anymore. And also... It's not a good storyline. This is a fun fact. Uh, We had to then make a video about it. And me and Daniel, a good friend of the podcast, Daniel, uh, created a news uh, story where we were like... Daniel's like petting a random like squirrel <laughs> statue that my parents had and about the huddled masses that were gathering to mourn that spoiler alert death. Yeah. <laughs> and it was you just... don't know the story of Romeo and Juliet. Yeah. And... One of the more famous stories <laughs> of literature. Yeah. Yeah. I used to love doing videos and like when our teacher said like gave us the option to do videos yeah. on anything. That was always like our go to thing, like yeah. me and my group of friends. I remember like the teacher was like well, you guys get a D for accuracy, but an A for creativity, because it was <laughs> hilarious. That's so, amazing. Yeah. Um, so, what is your earliest memories of Romeo and Juliet, uh, Baz Luhrmann's movie? I don't remember when it came out. Like, I didn't see it in theaters. Yeah, it did come out in 1996. Yeah, I didn't... I was into movies at the time, but it wasn't, like... I was never and never have been a huge Shakespeare person, so it was something probably just passed over. Yeah. But I do remember watching the following year's MTV Movie Awards, and it was nominated for a bunch of awards, and that's when I kind of caught on to it. And yeah. Then, but then I do remember like going, like, I don't want to watch it, because, again, not Shakespeare. But then when I watched it, I was like, oh, this is not like boring Shakespeare. It was very no, interesting and yeah. totally modernized. Yeah, it's modern and it's it's Baz Luhrmann. So if you've ever seen any of his films, he always does his own creative take of, you know, literature and mm-hmm. and it's obviously modern. But it is interesting that he chooses to keep the the script the same, the yeah, dialogue the same, exact same dialogue. But um, and that's in. what I remember. But I also, in my memories of it, I wasn't into it when it first came out. I didn't really know what it was. I think I might have rented it, but. It, once Titanic came out, then I was looking for all the Leonardo DiCaprio movies because yeah. that's when I was just like, I need to see more of Leonardo mm-hmm. DiCaprio. I need more. Yeah. Leo. I would say that this was like, I know he was on Growing Pains, but I think at that point I had stopped watching mm-hmm. Growing Pains, so I didn't remember him. And then I, he was in some other movies, but they were yeah. nothing that was on my radar. So I would say that this and Titanic were what introduced me to him. Yeah, definitely. And, I mean, that's, I think... He was obvious in a lot of movies, like he was in What Eats Gilbert Grape. Yeah. And, uh... Basketball Diaries. Basketball Diaries, which I... It was another movie I rented because I was like, I gotta watch Jack Yeah, Titanic. I need more of him. He's not dead. <laughs> Spoiler alert for Titanic. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, yeah. I... The thing I remember, though, and it's still, like, ingrained in me, is the soundtrack mm-hmm. um, being really cool. And I, I remember being a 
kind of like re obsessed with it when I was a freshman in high school. Because mm-hmm. I would like, for some reason, I chose to listen to it uh, when we'd go on volleyball trips. Like, I was on the volleyball team. And that was the CD that me was and my friends would pump listen it up to. Mix. <laughs> yeah, it's such a random one because there's a lot of like sad songs and there's some random songs, but yeah. I'm excited to hear all of them because oh, I'll yeah. probably be able to sing them. That's true. Uh, so, what is your? Oh, I'm gonna give you some facts. Yeah, that's what we do. Yeah. I it's been we haven't recorded in a week, and I'm all out of sorts yeah. right now. Yeah, it's been a because we were out of town last week, but yeah. we had some backlog yeah then we had some technical issues this week which ugh. ugh. but anyway so i digress go ahead (laughs) movie was released on november 1st 1996 Uh also known as one day before rai rai's 12th birthday oh yeah uh was made for the budget of 14.5 million dollars and it grossed 11.1 on its opening weekend and go went on to gross 147 million dollars worldwide so it was quite successful yeah uh, and then uh, fun facts about 1996. Uh, I know we did another movie that came out in 96, so I'll give you the some craft. other shows. Yeah, so some other shows that were popular were shows that I've literally never heard of. The Naked Truth, Fired Up, and I have heard of The Single Guy, but those that was literally the fifth and sixth most popular shows, according to Nielsen, in 1996. I have no clue. I remember The Single Guy. I remember Like Jonathan Guy. Silverman or yeah. yeah. The NBC. Yeah. NBC. Yeah, God, NBC used to be popular. I was all about NBC. So, uh, I don't know. I don't think there was, other than TGIF, mm-hmm. I don't think I watched any other station other than NBC and ABC on Fridays and then Fox, like, for Simpsons. Yeah, because I never watched stuff on CBS growing up. No, I that was like the Murphy old people Brown. station. Yeah, I wasn't rolling with the Murphy Brown. A uh, couple popular shows, or uh, popular songs, sorry, take a shot. Uh, it's going to be <laughs> Tony Braxton, You're Making Me High. And then she also had Unbreak My Heart. Oh. And uh, we talked about the Macarena, so we'll go with Crossroads by Cleveland's own Bone Thugs and Harmony. Yeah. Represent the land. <laughs> You're a nerd. <laughs> That's correct. Any chance you get to talk about Cleveland? That's my homeland. It's just as bad as me when I mention Montana. That is true. So, what do you think? Will it hold up? I think it will. Okay. In the sense that they're using classic dialogue and it's a really old play. It's held up for how many centuries? Mm -hmm. So I think in that sense it will. Um, As far as whether I'll like it as much as an adult, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Because obviously there's a lot of problematic things with Romeo and Juliet. And they're so young. Yeah. It's it's one of those things. It's kind of like, I think there's a joke about Little Mermaid that I've seen, like, on a meme mm-hmm. that was, like, when you were a kid when you watched Little Mermaid, and Ariel's, like, trying to get her dad to, like, let her go to the surface, and he, she's like, I'm not a little kid anymore. And I'm like, bitch, you are. You're 16. You're still a child. <laughs> you're still a wee now, little But at the time when I was a kid, I was like, yeah, she's an adult because she's 16. Like, no. Yeah, I'm going to go the other way. I don't think it's going to hold up. I think, okay. like you said, the literature will because it's something that has stood, you know, f- I don't know, 400 years. I, I don't know when it came out, when it was written. It when was it came ri- out. <laughs> it was written a really long time when, ago. When uh, Barnes & Nobles released it yeah, on when, a Tuesday. Yeah, yeah, it was a big Tuesday release. <laughs> And then Borders carried it before they went out of business. Sad. Well, I would hope Borders wasn't out of business in the 1600s. That's true. Actually, 1597 was so, when it was published. So I wasn't too far off no. with my 400-year guess. I know. I'm pretty proud of myself. Good job. Good job. Right, right, paid attention literature class. Congratulations. Yeah. So I'm going to say, but I think the the setting and some of the stuff that he'll use in his movie are going to be a little cheese ball. And that's why I'm going to say it's not going to hold up. I agree. So. I agree. I mean, I, I can see where you're coming from. Yes. Um, so I guess we'll pause right here. We'll hit the pause. pause, pause. pause. And also I, again, I forgot to say where you can stream it. That too. But 1996 classic. classic. And this is actually a 1597 classic. classic. Just kidding. Um, yeah, the movie... Well done. I know. I'm amazing. From what I can tell, or from what Google has told me, but, you know, don't take my word for it, uh, you can't really stream Romeo and Juliet anywhere on any of the services like Netflix. Mm-hmm. Um, but 
Uh, you can rent it on all of the other apps that you can rent movies on, like Vudu, YouTube, Amazon Prime. So, okay. Um, you do you. If you own it, then pop that DVD into your DVD player, <laughs> or more likely, some sort of game console. Like it me. looked like you paused, like you forgot <laughs> where a DVD goes. You're like pop that DVD <laughs> in your VCR. <laughs> I think Ashley's having a stroke. (laughs) Um, So we're going to go ahead and hit the pausey pause now. Try it again. Pausey pause. pause. And uh, we'll be right back to talk about Romeo and Juliet. Okay. And we're back. We just finished watching... William Shakespeare's Romeo plus Juliet. Or you'd say Baz Luhrmann's. I guess, yeah, Baz Luhrmann's Romeo plus Juliet. Uh, And we go ahead and, as we always do, we break down the movie. So we're going to go ahead and turn our dial on our television over to CNN for (laughs) some breaking news and talk about some technology. Yes. What pieces of technology did you notice? Honestly, the only thing I noticed was at the very beginning, the opening monologue where it's the narrator, basically, telling the story of Romeo and Juliet, and it's a box television and a news reporter telling the story as if it's a story. But it's weird, because I feel like she did that part, and then they redid the same monologue in trailer form, basically. Yeah. It's a little strange. To help, I guess maybe to help break down all of, like the players, mm-hmm. you know, that they There's have a... like the captions, and obviously this story does open with you knowing what's going to happen. Yes, but it was just a weird way to bring it to was that trailer part. I yeah. like the the TV part. I thought mm-hmm. that was clever. And honestly, I thought the the trailer is like kind of out of place as it seems. It it was different. Yeah. And something that I had never really seen in a movie. So I was like, well, it's a new way of like kind of going through the opening credits. Basically, yeah. So I thought it was neat. Uh, The only other piece of technology that I noticed was uh, a couple of the scenes when like they were near the beach, you would see some payphones in the background. That was that and just some box televisions. Yeah. Yeah. But that, I mean, that was was it. Yeah. So it it helps not date the movie. Yeah. I, I will say that. I will say that a lot of the music did not disappoint. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was a Love's Fool by the Cardigans. Cardigans. Mm-hmm. That was the only song I felt like that dated the movie. Yeah. Because you know it was like a jam. 20 something years ago. Yeah. yeah. In 1996 it was probably a super hot song. Mm-hmm. So that, but all the other song choices didn't really date them. There was obviously a Prince song. Yes. But it was, like, slowed down, and it was... Sang by a choir. Yeah. Yeah. I always loved that one. Yeah. Uh, and that was pretty much it that I had for technology, because I think Baz Luhrmann did, did try to keep it pretty neutral and make his own little world, as yeah. he does yeah. in a lot of his movies. So, um, should we move on to the next category? Yes, we shall. Our next category... <laughs> Take a shot! Our next category is, kids would call it a throwback, we call it the prime of our teens, where we talk about fashion choices, any dated references or offensive jokes, and uh, we talk about whether they could get away with this exact movie in the year 2019, that is which we are in right now. Yes. So, fashion choices, hit, uh, what what did you think? Uh, some of them that jumped out at me, and obviously it's classic literature but set in modern times was john legazamo uh during like the opening scene his yeah. character title uh has a vest with like i want to say i think it was the virgin mary on it yeah which was a little weird that i don't know that anyone would ever wear that yeah uh something that i noticed noticed throughout the film was hawaiian shirts yes and i was just like but really yeah. i don't know if that was necessarily something people were wearing. I guess they were, but not maybe not so bright and colorful. Yeah. I don't know. I can't remember. It was so long ago. But <laughs> I I put that as well. And I also put the fact that, like, Romeo's, especially in the beginning of the movie, always wore, like, baggy suits. Yeah. 
And to me, that was the only thing that dated the movie as far as fashion choices, because I think everything else was like a conscious effort by Baz Luhrmann to create this, I don't know, it's like almost like futuristic, but then also like classic style. Like, mm-hmm. it was its own thing. Like, you couldn't inherently go, this is 90s. Like, it was its own weird weird style <laughs> the only thing like i noticed they tried to it seemed like keep uh juliet and her like hairstyle it reminded me a lot of like the 70s version of romeo and juliet yeah it was very classic was just, like straight and long yeah but then they would do some like different ways of pulling it back that mm-hmm. were kind of like uh renaissancean or and i'm sure that's not even a word but it sounded nice it sounded good but uh leo's hair was just his regular hair that it just reminds it's like me of perfectly, like perfectly and it's like choppy yeah it's perfectly it, tousled i felt like i i felt it reminded me of anne Heche, so oh god <laughs> that's where i went with it oh i just i was just like damn leo and his perfectly tousled <sighs> like bleach blonde hair yeah but, but I, I there wasn't a lot of bad fashion choices no so. because like i said i i felt like he kept it it was there were like some really over the top mm-hmm. fashion choices, but I think it worked well in this style of movie. Yeah, um, I did like Paul Rudd's hair. Paul Rudd, spoiler alert, plays uh, Dave Paris. Yes, which is basically like the guy that Juliet's parents are pushing mm-hmm. her on. Um, but his hair was so big, it was like quaffed really, yeah. really large, and it was just funny to see that. It also um, does not age. 20-something no. years later, that man looks exactly the same. He really does. Yeah. He had a little bit more of a baby face, but not even that by that much. Oh. He still has that same look to him. Yes. Um, any offensive or dated references? I can honestly say, other than, like, the technology that kind of... Those couple... No offensive jokes, because it's obviously classic literature that you're dealing with, and they yeah. kept the script. And I... There's no dated references there wasn't like a poster of the spice girls in the no, background or anything the like that the thing i noticed was like uh juliet's room was very like teenage girl and mm-hmm. it had like stickers everywhere but it was all like angels yeah like i don't know like that's what i love about baz lerman like his directing style is because he thinks of all these little things and yeah. he like incorporates them so Oh, and it's amazing when you can sit back and watch a movie that's as old as this is, and you're like, wow, not dated at all. Yeah. Like, you did a fantastic job with this. Right. I, I agree, obviously, with the way this movie is done. It's hard to find an offensive joke or dated reference. With that being said, do you think this they could get away with this in 2019? Yeah, because I didn't think there was anything too edgy. I know there's a lot of gun battles and stuff yeah. like that, but it's like... It stayed true to the script. I love how the guns would say stuff like sword and dagger on the gun. Yeah, I li- I really liked the guns, like with the you know the saints on them. And yeah, they were really cool. I always like that. Brilliantly done. Like one of my favorite things that they do, and it's just really uh, small. Is uh, uh, Mercutio is like drops his gun on the beach. Yeah, and it just and goes it just in straight, goes right into as the as if sand. it was like a, a knife. And it says uh, all you see on the side of the gun is dagger. dagger. Yeah, and I was just like, that's whoever thought to like do something like that is brilliant. And I'm like, that's stuff that I would absolutely translate very well today. Yeah, as long as they didn't try to be like having Takamon cell phones and stuff like that. And I said talk them on uh, so <laughs> i'm just making up words go ahead and take your third shot since we came back from break you gotta talk them on cell phone <laughs> talk them on it's like uh the pokemon <laughs> what is going on? um should we move on yes we shall we're gonna go ahead and to our man. <laughs> wow. oh my god you want to take a second yeah, just take a deep breath take and a... <laughs> talk about. Let's go ahead and talk about our category. Well, hello there, where we talk about any famous or recognizable actors or actresses that we may have forgot were in the film. Would you like to start us off? Because I'll just flub a name. Oh sure. Um, right off the bat, so the movie opens up and it's like the Mercutio guys are driving their car. And there was Jamie Kennedy, which mm-hmm. I kind of forgot was in the movie. And then Zach Orth, which is, he was in Revolution and... He was in Casual. Casual and Fringe. Yeah. 
So he's a he, character actor. Like if you saw him, you're like, oh yeah, that yeah, guy. he's been in a lot of things. Mm-hmm. And then my favorite was like uh, Christina Pickles, which is Ross and Monica's mom yes. played Romeo's mother. So I was excited about that. How about you? I noticed uh, the lady that played Juliet's nurse. I could not place her. Oh yeah, until I... you looked it up for me. It was Professor Sprout from Harry Potter fame. Yes. Uh, then I did not realize until the wedding scene, the person standing next to Leo was Jesse Bradford because he looks like a baby. Yeah, he was, t- I don't, I should have looked up how old he was, but he was, he looked so, so young. Yeah. And to your credit with Professor Sprout, this probably just shows you that she's a pretty good actress. Uh, she's a British lady and she was like a Spanish nurse. So yeah. she didn't look anything like Professor Sprout. No. In that sense. And then the uh, last one that I noticed was there's just, there's a guy working at the pool hall yeah where they're shooting pool and he's an older guy and he played the sheriff in Camp Nowhere oh really with Christopher Lloyd and them like he's yeah. trying to bust uh, Christopher Lloyd's character the whole time oh and I picked up on him I was like oh I don't even know that he had a line in the movie but he, he there's was a it. couple of people that didn't really have a lot of lines the other one I noticed was like Mercutio is uh, Harold Perrineau, who who is in a bunch of stuff, but, yeah. like, Lost. And he's in Claws, that show with, like, Niecy Nash. Oh, okay. He plays her brother. And he's been in a bunch of other stuff. Yeah, but... definitely the main thing would be probably most famous. I think Lost. when I re-watched this movie probably, like, 10 or 15 years ago, mm-hmm. it was after we had watched some episodes of Lost, and I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> it's I Michael. never, like, because I remember Mercutio. It's a very memorable part. Yeah. But I just didn't put the two and two together that that was him. Mm-hmm. But that was it for me. How about you? Um, that's all I had for those guys. Yeah. Other than Paul Rudd, because I... I did forget he was in it. I had yeah, we didn't mention my... it. And yeah. then uh, we, were, we were starting the movie and you're like, is Paul Rudd in this? And they did have yes. uh, some pretty famous people play the dads. They yes. Had Brian Dennehy uh, and Dennehy, Paul yeah. Sorvino playing the fathers. Yeah. Was, they had a very well, and it aged very well cast. Yeah, definitely, because so, a yeah. lot of those people are still very relevant. And um, and then, as I like to note, the mother, the one who played Juliet's mother, I kept going, she looks really familiar. And then you're like, yeah, yeah she looks like... She looked like Jessica Lang, But she's not <laughs> Jessica Lange. She, was not she Jessica looks Lange. a lot like her. Yeah. So, should we move on to, is it even good? Yes, we shall. <laughs> That's the name of the category. <laughs> the category is, is it even good? Is or... it even good where we talk about the plot... And we talk about casting choices, and then we talk about our funniest lines or moments and our cringiest. That is correct. So, uh, what about the plot? I thought the plot was utterly terrible, and I will go on record right now. Won't stand the test of time. Kids will not learn about this in school. And I am totally joking. It is a very believable plot where I think that happens. You know, you have the... It's kind of like even... They did it last summer in Crazy Rich Asians, where... The family doesn't like them getting together. Yeah, They'd rather you get been... with someone else. It's something that's done a lot, but it's a timeless plot. It, it really is. It, it, I mean, it's been done over and over. It's been used in one of my favorite movies of all time, West Side Story. Mm-hmm. And it's a movie that's being currently remade right now. Yeah, and they did. I think they did a remake of Romeo and Juliet like with uh, Haley Stanfield like two years ago or a year ago. I don't think it did very well. Oh, I didn't even know that was made. Yeah. So, oh. But, I mean, it's going to be used over and over oh, yeah. again. Because you're always going to be, every generation learns it in school. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I was, I noted that, you know, I think it's hard not to be somewhat believable because we've seen the story rewritten so much. Mm-hmm. And as a teenager, I thought that it was a romantic story. But now as an adult, I'm like, no, it's a tragic Total story. Total tragic story. <laughs> and there's things to learn from it. It's not just about the fact that Romeo and Juliet were in love and they... They were in love to the end. Like, that's not the point of the story. Yeah. But when I was a kid, I was like, that's just so romantic that two people would just do all that for each other. And you're like, no. No. First of all, they knew each other for like two days. Yeah. That's true. Anyway. (laughs) (laughs) Um, How about the casting choices? I thought, in hindsight, it's an excellent cast. Like, going beyond just Leonardo DiCaprio Mm -hmm. and Claire Danes, who are obviously exceptional actors and very well-known and award-winning. It's 
you look at the people they got to play minor characters. Like, yeah. John Leguizamo is a very underrated actor. And he really is. Baz Luhrmann obviously appreciated him and put him in multiple films. Yes. Paul Rudd's a great actor. I thought Harold Pernu as Mercutio was a great... Everybody on there is really good actors. For the most part, yeah. And I at agree. the time, I don't know that any of them were all that famous with the exception of like Paul Servino and Brian Dennehy. Yeah. Like, Leo think... wasn't even that huge. Obviously, not as big as he is now. Didn't he get nominated for uh, What's Eating Gilbert Grape, though? Yeah, he did, but he was... was like three years before that. But I'm saying he wasn't the Leo that we know now, who's the no. leading role in a huge movie every year. Like, You're this right. was probably his first true leading role. Basketball Diaries. Okay, you gotta go ahead and just take... Gotta prove me wrong. No, well, I'm just stating facts. Okay, well, so, yes, you are correct. He, he was in a... Uh, starring role in another film that I kind of forget about because I don't know that I've seen. But I, I will agree ours. with you that I think, to me, he didn't explode, or he wasn't on my radar until Titanic, so That's even true. then, even though I know like uh, there's plenty of people that loved him in this movie, mm-hmm. but from, I mean, I was just, at that point, I was, I think I was too young, but if you were on the, you know, the cover at, of Tiger Beat, then I didn't know you were. <laughs> I, did, I didn't have Tiger Beat. I, God, I don't know how I Sort of, I think uh, there was another one called like Twist. Yeah, there wasn't like There's anything things like, like that this for, that don't exist for boys. Right. I don't think. I mean, I guess I could have been reading Tiger Beat. Yeah, I mean, there was stories about girls too in it, but yeah. but it was That's mostly true. geared for girls. It was always like bright pink or yeah. you know. And I think um, it just kind of went with becoming a teenager. You became more into films, and I, yeah, when I was you know eleven, I really wasn't into them yet. Or you didn't care about the actors or actresses That's true. as much. Yeah. You just were like, oh, I like this movie and I like this character. But you weren't like going, who's Leonardo DiCaprio or like yeah. Claire Danes. But Claire Danes well, is also on My So-Called Life. Yes. Which I think came out that year or the year before. I think the year before. Yeah. And yeah. that was a big that was a, a big thing. But big then show. it got canceled because people are dumb. <laughs> people are dumb. I, I get really sensitive about shows that get canceled when they shouldn't get canceled. Yeah. You know? Oh, and, and then there's shows that aren't good that last for years and years. Are you implying that Two and a Half Men wasn't one of your favorite f- f- TV shows? Somehow I mean, lasted twelve years. Teach their own, but I, I just, ah, uh, I don't know. This oh, is I, a discussion for yeah, another so, time. Yeah, sorry, we're going on a tangent. <laughs> Let's go ahead and move on to our next subcategory: our funniest line or moment. And what was yours? There's a couple, but I think my favorite, just because I'm a big Paul Rudd fan, was when, at the party, when uh, Dave Paris is dancing with Juliet, Mm -hmm. and he's just like, I don't know, every time I see him dancing, I just think of him, like, dancing in one of the, like, music videos he does with Jimmy Fallon, yes, or uh, dancing in Role Models when he's, like, in front of the tow truck, and he's just dancing back and forth. He just has that, like, you know, goofy Paul Rudd smile, and I just couldn't help but laugh at it but then she's like all distracted well and i'm just like dude leo's in the room paul rudd's right in front of you (laughs) i'd pick paul rudd now that's the difference between now and then Uh 12 year old ashley would probably have taken leo even though i loved paul rudd in clueless i loved josh but obviously in this movie he's not this dreamy guy yeah but you know 32 year old ashley would take the paul rudd I'm going on record right now so we can look back on this because this podcast will obviously stand the test of time it will. and be famous in 30 years. I feel like Leonardo DiCaprio is going to go the way of Marlon Brando. Yeah. He was a heartthrob, super good looking guy. I feel like he's slowly letting himself go. Yeah. I'm saying it. I'm saying it right now. Not that he's a bad looking guy. If in 10 years people are like, oh man, he's kind of let himself go a little bit. You're going to look back and go, hey, you know who was the first one to point that out? Ryan from ruining our childhood. I will say that I don't think he as is as good looking as he was no. like even ten years ago. Yeah, and I will, I will, I will agree with you on that. He's not. He's not. There's some people that can age really, really gracefully, like George Clooney, Paul Rudd, Paul freaking Rudd. Yeah, but. I just kind of noticed that I was like, man, that guy used to be such a good looking guy. And it's not to say he's bad looking now, no. I'm like, but I just feel like I'm like, he's not, Ooh, he, he might go that way. Cause I kind of look at Brando and go, how did that happen? Yeah. And Super now, good looking. We might be witnessing it. Maybe. He's you generation. know who else kind of did it? Val Kilmer. Oh yeah. Val definitely. Kilmer was a great looking guy in Top Gun and boy. <laughs> <laughs> 
hey, you really shouldn't talk about people like this because then one of these days you're going to wake up and look in the mirror and be like, oh, crap, I just Val Kilmered myself. <laughs> <laughs> I just Val Kilmered it. Sad. Uh, anyway, <laughs> uh, what was yours? My favorite and funniest line, man. I'm sorry. I'm just taking us on tangents on this okay. episode. Uh, I love the opening scene of the movie when they're in the gas station and they're having a gun battle. Yes. Uh, I like how, like, I already pointed out how the guns say swords on them, but it was almost filmed like a spaghetti western in a sense. Like, they're shooting guns at each other and they're hitting signs and the signs are spinning. Like, it reminds me of, like, an arcade shooting gallery. Yeah. So I I love that scene. And then also just when I was learning about Romeo and Juliet in high school, I remember my teacher's like... Yeah, when they're saying, like, did you bite your thumb at me? He's like, that's the equivalent to me. And like, did you just say fuck you to me? Yeah. And I was like, oh, that makes it so much cooler. (laughs) Oh, definitely. I think that's why this story is easy to relate to when you're a kid, because there are things, and it makes you realize that, like, insults have always been a thing in our human existence. And there's themes that have spanned time, so. Yeah, centuries. Centuries. Fart jokes, for, for instance. They never, they never get old. I remember reading uh, a Chaucer, and there, there was a, literally a story, and it ends with like a fart joke, and I'm like, this thing was written at the beginning of time. It seems like it's like one of the first literature That's awesome. to exist, at, or one of the first pieces of literature. Go to ahead exist. and take that shot, folks. <laughs> yeah, I can't talk. And there's a fart joke in yeah. it. It's amazing. Mm-hmm. We're amazing as humans. Yes, we are. Um, <clears throat> uh, what about your cringiest line? I had a lot of them, and I thought, like, overall, I felt like as good as Baz Luhrmann was with the movie, he put Romeo and Juliet kind of in silly and unnecessary predicaments at times. Yeah. Like, their first interaction is them miming through a fish tank. I like that part. I just think it's cheesy. Oh. And I'm like, why are you doing that? And then, like, the other part that kind of goes hand in hand with that was... Romeo uh, hops the garden fence to get back to Juliet, and he's, like, sneaking around the pool area (laughs) terribly. He would have been the worst cat burglar. But all I could think of was uh, Filch and Harry Potter sneaking around Hogwarts, and I'm like, you are terrible. Yeah, he was not good at the sneaking. What was your cringiest? I had a couple, but the one that I ultimately chose was, I have an issue with CGI and weird edits Mm -hmm. and i didn't like when father lawrence was doing his monologue about how he's gonna concoct this plan with juliet to fake her death and that way her and romeo can be together and i didn't like the way it was edited because it was like his face and then behind him was just a like a montage of all the people in the movie yeah and i i just i just thought it dated the movie too yeah no i agree that I don't think that happens in movies. And I've I've noticed a lot since we've started this podcast, a lot of movies in the 90s do that. Mm-hmm. It was like, must have been like a, a cool thing. Like, they're like, guess what we can do? We can do a stupid montage while showing a face. Yeah, like a blue screen, green screen type situation. So should we move? Oh, did you have any other? Because I had some random things. Uh, One of the ones where I was just like, God, this, like, uh, Jamie Kennedy's famous and... That's great and all, and he's kind of funny, but he, he, I think he slightly is miscast. Like, he's kind of out of his element. And there's a scene where Romeo, like, jumps out of their car and does the climbing of the garden wall. Uh-huh. And he stands there and screams Romeo's name like he's dying. And was like, that him or was it Mercutio? No, it was Jamie Kennedy. Oh. Because I was just like, dude, he's just jogging away from the car calm down bro yeah. you don't need but that's to how intense people were in shakespeare i guess yeah i guess I so know. that was that was my only other one where i was like dude mine were just like all of like the speed edits mm-hmm. in that opening scene that you talked about uh at the oh just that and then which i, I know baz Luhrmann has done he does it in moulin rouge mm-hmm. um but i find it f- better executed in Moulin Rouge, but just, like, the weird speed edits, it actually made me nauseated a little bit, because they were doing it a lot the first, like, 20 minutes of the movie. I agree. Up until the moment that, like, Romeo and Juliet see each other, Mm -hmm. and then it kind of slows down. Yeah. And that's actually why I liked that scene, because I was like, oh, finally, we're not going to see any, like, weird, fast movement. 
Yeah. It, it was just, like, very choppy. And a lot of it was unnecessary. Like, yes. I remember when, like, uh, John Leguizamo, like, dropped to his knees and, like, pulled out his guns. Yeah. He dropped to his knees at a normal speed and then pulled out the guns at the speed of light. And I was like, well, that was pointless. Why are yeah, you doing it, that? I don't know. It was just like Baz Luhrmann found something he liked and he's like, I'm going to do it to everything. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm Michael Bay with a lens flare. <laughs> right? Yeah. No, that was J.J. Abrams. My bad. J.J. Abrams with a lens flare. Michael Bay is the unnecessary CGI and explosion. That is correct. <laughs> I actually liked the Romeo and Juliet scene. I thought, for me, that held up because I liked that scene when I was a kid. Because paired with that song... That it becomes like kind of like their theme. Okay. I I don't know. I just thought it was romantic. I I think like I was I just found that annoying, but I also felt like as it progressed, where they kind of did some silly stuff like that, I still felt like the scenes were like really well done. Like I thought yeah. that kind of goes to how good Leo and Claire Danes are. And then I I wanted to mention my favorite thing mm-hmm. of all time: Claire Danes' cry face. I had that uh, on my does it hold up, because nothing holds up better than a Claire Danes crack face. Yeah. <laughs> it happened twice, when her dad was yelling at her, mm-hmm. and then, obviously, the end scene, when, spoiler alert, Romeo she, dies. Yeah. <laughs> Romeo dies, and then she dies. Yeah. I was just like, oh my god, it's amazing. She's a really good actress. I just she don't is. know why I find her cry face so hilarious. Because <laughs> it is hilarious, and it's cringy to look at. <laughs> Oh my god. We're we're ruining Claire Danes for a lot of people, I oh, feel yeah. like. If you didn't realize she had an ugly cry face, it's like, you do now! Yeah. <laughs> You're like, damn it! Can't watch Homeland seriously anymore. <laughs> um, should we move on to our final thoughts? We shall. And as always, on our podcast, it is award season. We like to hand out two awards each week, and the first is the valedictorian of the Nicolas Cage Online School of Bad Acting. And who are you giving your award to? It was funny that you mentioned Jamie Kennedy, because I gave it to Jamie Kennedy. Because he had, like, one line, or I guess a couple lines, Mm -hmm. in the beginning of the movie when he's talking to the Capulet gang. Yeah. And he's talking about the bite your thumb. thumb. I just don't think he delivered Shakespeare very good. He was out of his element. They could have found a way better actor Mm -hmm. to... Like, I get... How, what Baz Luhrmann was trying to do in the sense of casting people that maybe wouldn't normally be in a Shakespearean play. Yeah. But he just did not pull it off. Whereas, like, I think, like, 95% of the cast pulled off all the lines well. Yeah. Sometimes it sounded modern, and yeah. you could almost, like, understand them. Yeah. So, but he was just, yeah. It's good that he probably only had really that one focus yeah. at the beginning of the movie. And apparently a line that you mentioned, because I don't remember that. I, I must have been, like, writing something down at that moment. Oh, okay. How about you? For me, I went with an actor that I had never actually recognized before. His name is Dash Myhoch. Oh, the... Ben Volio? Ben Volio, yeah. Okay. I felt he... Well, for one, I told you he looks just like Rob Gronkowski. I thought he kind of... He reminds me of Michael Rappaport a little bit. Okay, I can see that. Yeah. So... I think where his problem is, is like, he was slightly better than Jamie Foxx, but his scene partner... Jamie Kennedy? You, sorry, Jamie, <laughs> Jamie Kennedy. Jamie Foxx wins Academy Awards. Uh, he's in a lot of scenes with the guy who plays Mercutio, and he gets overshadowed in every single scene that he's in because the other guy is so good, and he's so bad. I'm like, yo, Gronk, stick to football, bro. No. <laughs> so, that I... was mine. That guy looked familiar, and I looked him up, and he's been in a bunch of stuff that we've seen, like a lot of TV shows, like SVU and The Good Wife, Mm -hmm. but I thought he was in something that more substantial, like I was like, oh, he's so-and-so on this movie, but no, he just kind of looks like some people, like Like you thought he looked like the guy from Heavyweights. I did, until you're like, oh, that came out the same year as that, so that kid would have been like 15. Yeah. So I was like, oh, Um, fair enough. Should we move on? We shall. So the next award is our more prestigious one, the Thomas J. Hanks Award for Exceptional Acting. Who did you give it to? And I feel like we're going to be picking the same person. I gave it to Mercutio. Damn you, Ryan! (laughs) I thought that actor owned every scene he was in. He has to cross-dress and sing Young Hearts at a party. And it's like probably like one of the more exciting scenes in the movie. Yeah. And like I said, every scene he was in with his with Gronkowski, he steals. 
And yeah. he was fantastic. And that's not to say like Leo and Claire weren't no, they were weren't good. great. They were both really good. But I'm like, this guy was just cast very well. And I w- I'm kind of surprised he didn't become a bigger actor. I know he's in a lot of things, but he's never like a starring like role. Like exploded. Yeah. And I was like, dude, you were great. No, I always, I, when I was a kid, I loved his character. Mm-hmm. And it actually made me, like this movie did help make me understand this play better Mm -hmm. as like a student. And I think it gave me more of a feeling that when Mercutio does die, like that I was super sad. Yeah. Like, because I visually could see this character as him Mm -hmm. and he did make every scene he was in more exciting. And it was like a breakup from like weird edits that they would do with like John Leguizamo's parts. And then the kind of boring stuff with Paul Rudd. Yeah. I mean, I love Paul Rudd, but his part was a little boring. Mm-hmm. And then, like, the romantic stuff with Romeo and Juliet. Yeah, he was definitely this, like, bright light out of, like, this some of the duller scenes. Definitely. And then his, yeah, and his uh, death scene was pretty tragic and yeah, sad. very much. I had a feeling that you were going to pick him when you asked me what the actor's name was before we started recording. I was like, damn it, Ryan, <laughs> there's so many people you could have chose. Gotta give it up to my boy Harold Pernu. Yeah, obviously we agree, because yeah. I picked the same person. So, should we move on to our final thoughts? Yes, we shall. So, what do you think? Do you think this movie holds up to your adult standards? I went into it thinking there was probably going to be stuff that was going to make it dated for me, yeah. and I wasn't going to enjoy it. And I don't think that was the case. I don't think there was too much that dated it. it obviously, you're using a classic script. I thought the casting was great. I really enjoyed it. I also like, I like Baz Luhrmann's style of movie where yeah, he definitely. incorporates music very well into the movie mm-hmm. where I don't feel like that's something that kind of happens very much anymore. So I thought it was really good. And then obviously you can't go wrong with some Claire Danes cry face. <laughs> so I thought it was really, really well. Made. I'm not going to lie. I thought you were going to choose her for your uh, Nicholas Cage online school of bad acting, even though she's not a bad actress, just, yes. but because that can be a little distracting at times. Her correct guy? Yeah, her correct guy. Yeah, yeah, but I agree with you. Mm-hmm. And and honestly, if they were not to do the, you know, classic dialogue, if they were to just write the story, I think that would have dated it. Because then they would have re- referenced stuff in the 90s and done, like, you know, he created, like, Baz Luhrmann created this, his own little world yeah. to go along with it. And I think it helps. And I, I don't I think we did see it, in, like, now that I'm thinking about it, I think we did have to watch it in school. Because mm-hmm. I remember, like, my freshman English class, we had to watch the... English Clash? <laughs> English Clash. English Clash. Um, Take a shot? <laughs> no. <laughs> we had to watch the 1968 version. Uh-huh. And then we had to watch this one, and we had to, like, compare them. Oh. And, yeah, I mean, this, I think this probably helped teachers in a way to, like, get kids more interested in it, because you had... I mean, not maybe not now. I think because like like you I brought don't know up a good girls point. Girls think Leonardo DiCaprio is handsome, like you had said earlier. But he's still handsome. Um, um, I you brought up a good point where it helps you understand it better because mm-hmm. the acting and the scenery and what's going on and it's you know that I wish I had watched this when I was in high school because I would have had a better grasp of it. I didn't watch it until I was like, I think uh, maybe in my early 20s, I uh-huh. might have seen it. So I didn't see it back then. And we just watched the 1968 version where it's like classical scenery and classic script. And it was yeah. a little hard to follow because I do not, I don't translate Shakespeare very well. I've it's, never have. It's, it's a tough thing. Yeah. But then, you know, what? you kind of... Like, they've done that where they've kind of modernized it, and they did it with, like, Ten Things I Hate About You, and I thought that did really well, where they obviously didn't keep the same script. No. But I don't know. I haven't seen that in a while, but I don't remember it being very cheesy. No. I I, I was just saying in the sense of, like, if they were to take this exact movie, like, Mm -hmm. the sets, everything, and then have a modern script, I think it would come out to be a little cheesy. But since he kind of tried to keep it... It's obviously modern because yeah. there's like television and there's more modern cars. Mm-hmm. But I think he tried to stay away from a lot of '90s identifiers to where it it's it worked well with like the classic strip. Yes, script. I can't talk, and I don't know where I'm going with this. It holds up. Bye. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Agreed. It holds up very nicely. 
So that is it for us. That is correct. Another another episode in the books. Yep. Still don't know how to end it after ten episodes. Yes. Transition to the end. We're gonna go ahead and transition to our outro where we remind people to leave a review and subscribe <laughs> on just iTunes. reading our sheet. Read it off ver- verbatim. <laughs> That's just you're not supposed to read that. No, that's why you're like, let's go ahead and transition to the end. I'm like, nope, transition to the outro. It's <laughs> on our run sheet. Uh, thanks for listening, guys. And like Ryan said, if you want to do us a solid, yes. please review and subscribe to us on iTunes mm-hmm. or Google Play or anywhere where you can leave a note. Um, and check out our Facebook page Yeah. Um, and like it. Uh, we sometimes update it and... Let you know when new episodes are going to be available. And, you know, we're trying to change it a little. So I, I actually put more stuff up there. Mm-hmm. Maybe, like, share some articles, some news stories of some of the stuff that we like. I don't know. Tell us what to do. Yeah. Tell, tell us what you like. I was going to say, we're, we're here for you. Uh, also, check you us out like on... Whores. <laughs> <laughs> tell us what you like. Uh, <laughs> creepy. Uh, check us out on Instagram at Ruining Our Childhood. And Facebook, also at Ruining Our Childhood. And Twitter at ROC Movie Podcast. Yeah, that's what, it's, that's what it is. That is what it is. Um, uh, tell your friends and family if you enjoy it, please. Try to build the peop- our, our podcast by word of mouth. Yeah. Yeah. How else could we ruin it? I don't know. Somebody stumbles upon it through PodCoin or something. I don't know. Anyway, we're (laughs) out of here, guys. Bye. Bye. Hey, guys. We want to talk to you a little bit about the PodCoin app. Yes! The PodCoin app pays you to listen to Ruining Our Childhood, as well as your other favorite podcasts. You can use the PodCoin you earn to claim gift cards from some of your favorite stores. Starbucks. Check. Amazon. Correct. Target. Uh, Duh. Seriously, it's pretty legit, guys. Download the PodCoin app today on iPhone or Android and use the code RUINING to get 300 PodCoin just for signing up. That's 300 PodCoin by using R-U-I-N-I-N-G. So if you're basically listening to podcasts all day anyways, might as well make some money off the deal, am I right? Totally. I mean, free coffee for something I'm already doing? Sounds like a great deal to me. Mm Mm-hmm. So go give the PodCoin app a try today, and also don't forget to listen to Ruin our, Ruining Our Childhood, that's the name of the thing, and make that money, guys. Okay. Okay, bye! bye.